right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. We are in Genesis 46 this week. Last week, Genesis 45, what happened? We got some people that were not here, so recap for them. The big reveal. Yeah, Joseph finally reveals himself. And his brother's response? Fear. Yeah, they're scared. Uh, they don't believe it, and then once they do believe it, then they're scared. And they're going to stay scared for a while, actually. The text will get back to that. But uh, they have good reason to be scared, obviously, because of how they treated him. But what's Joseph's response? Yeah, he was able to forgive them, and why was he able to forgive them? Yeah, he could see, he could see the hand of God at work. He had a heavenly perspective that gave him the ability to, um, well, one, he saw their character changed. That's the big thing. It's not like he just said, oh, it's no big deal. If they had still remained evil, you know, forgiveness requires a step of reconciliation on the part of those who desire of forgiveness. If they had not changed their character and Joseph had tested them and they had failed the test and just hightailed it out of there and left Benjamin to rot on his own, then Joseph would have known they never really changed much. And he probably would have reacted quite differently. But the fact that they did all choose to stick together to, to stand up for the brother who was going to be taken into slavery, uh, it, it shows that over those years something had changed within them. And so that's another part of how he was able to extend the forgiveness. Uh, and that's a subject maybe we can look at another time, the question of, you know, in order to forgive someone, does there need to be repentance? It's a good question. Some Christians <coughs> divided on it, uh, but it seems that even God himself is unwilling to forgive unless there is a sense of repentance or contrition on the part. So, uh, but that's another time, another story, another passage. Let's look at Genesis 46 then. Jacob hears at the end of the last chapter he heard that his son, his favorite son, was alive, and so what was his response? Yeah, he's, he's like revived. He says, I'm going, you know, I'm, let's go. I'm going to go see him. First, he didn't believe it, and uh, his heart was, was cold. It was, it was hardened. It was, uh, the phrasing in Hebrew is not translated well in NIV, but it's like he, he became just almost dead inside. And then when they showed him the evidence, of all the stuff that he had sent, and then he believed his, his spirit was revived within him. And this man who has been talking about pretty much nothing but his own death for the last few chapters, every time we've heard of Jacob, he's almost always just talked about his death, going down to the grave, dying in bereavement. You know, it's like he had almost lost all hope. Now his spirit's revived. <clears throat> and so he says, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna see him before I die. So still, he knows his time is short, he knows his death is <coughs> But uh, he's going to have a few more years, actually over a decade longer before he actually does die. So in 46 then, <clears throat> chapter 46, Israel set out <clears throat> with all that was his. And he, when, he, when he reached Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. Why is it significant that he offers sacrifices at Beersheba? What do we know about Beersheba from the past year we've been studying Genesis? This is why it's always good to keep the whole picture in mind, to keep the story, the flow of the narrative. Beersheba is Jacob's childhood home. It's where Isaac raised him. It's where Abraham made the treaty with Abimelech. It's, it's, a, it's a family center. It's, it's like almost like going to his hometown or his childhood home before then heading off somewhere. Uh, it's where he left from when he went to Canaan. I mean, excuse me, when he went up to Patamara, uh, back when he was a young man, he left from Beersheba. And it was then that he had had a vision and God appeared to him at Bethel after he left Beersheba and said, I'm going to bless you. So this is a, a repeating of life events. This is a cyclical, cyclical uh, pattern in the life of the patriarchs. And this time, instead of heading north from Beersheba, he's heading south. Instead of going up to Patamara, he's going south to Egypt. But again, there's going to be a vision, and God is going to 
that's formed here. So these place names, they aren't just random spots. When the author mentions a place, there's usually an importance. Sometimes we don't know that importance. It may be lost to us, and, and maybe only the ancient reader would have known. But in this case, it's, it's important. So by doing checking, cross-referencing, seeing, OK, where's, where have I heard that name before? You can see in Genesis 21, Genesis 28, you see these themes reemerging of leaving the land, being blessed in spite of this leaving, and eventually going to return blessed even more than before. And that's the whole theme of the book of Exodus. So uh, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac, and God spoke to Israel in a vision at night. Again, spoke to him in a vision at night. Jacob, Jacob, here I am, he replied. And that's just a biblical response, like, yes, or you rang, or what can I do for you? It's just a normal, uh, here I am, Hineni in Hebrew. It just means, oh, it's like when you pick up the phone, hello. I am the God, I am God, the God of your father, he said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you up again. And Joseph's own hand close your eyes. Why would God tell him, don't be afraid to go down to Egypt? Why would he be afraid? Think about the overall stories in Genesis, the patriarch sojourns. What's happened before when patriarchs have gone to Egypt? Yeah, bad things have happened, basically. God's protected them, but going down to Egypt was always a no-no. Uh, Abraham did it, the whole lying about his wife, sister thing, and God still protected him in spite of that. Uh, God told Isaac, don't go to Egypt. You know, there was this sense of, for Abraham and Isaac, Egypt was seen as, don't go there. That's, just stay in the promised land, stay in the promised land. But now, God's specifically giving Jacob the okay to go down to Egypt. Because he had told Abraham back in Genesis 15, your descendants will be slaves in the land for 400 years. They'll be treated, they'll be oppressed. And when they're, uh, then when I'm ready, I'm going to bring them back again to this land. So there was already the, the, the end goal in mind would involve a sojourn in Egypt. So Jacob is being reassured. He's not just going to Egypt to save his own family and to see his son and all that. There's a reassurance from God. Yeah, it's okay. This is, you can do this. I, I, your, your grandfather and your father were not to go down to Egypt. They did. They didn't listen to me. Bad things happened. But it's okay. You can go. What was not permissible for them is permissible for you. And so this would have given Jacob some comfort and would have, would have reminded him of this whole purpose in all of this. And that's the thing to keep in mind. It's not just a random story of a father reunited with a lost son. It's not a fable. It's not a story that we tell kids, okay, this is why you should be nice to your brothers. It's not any of those things. This is a saga. This is a family saga. And what we're seeing is Jacob is being reminded here, and the reader is being reminded of the entire purpose of this saga, the whole point, the whole overriding point of this, which started in Genesis 12 and came to its expression as the covenant was passed on. And we're going to see these terms that are used to bring that back to mind. I am God, the God of your father. He said, do not be afraid to go out of Jesus, for I will make you into a great nation. We heard that before. Genesis 12, I will make your name great. Promise to Abraham. This is, this is confirming, this is the, the, net, the unfolding of that promise of the covenant. I will go down to Egypt with you. And, and NIV says, I will surely bring you back again. But the verb is... You will go down, it's the verb Yerod, it means to go down, and then I will bring you up, Allah, it's the verb to raise up. And geographically it would make sense because Egypt's south and it's lower in, in um, elevation. They were going to Goshen, which is on the, like, the coastal area, and they were in the mountainous regions of, near Hebron. But it's also, there's a theological component, is you will go down and I will bring you up. And that's going to literally happen. Jacob's going to go down to Egypt, and he's going to die in Egypt. He's going to be buried in Egypt. And his sons are going to bring his bones back to the land. So he's going to literally be brought back. 
But even more than that, there's a hint, and it's just a hint. It's not a proof text. It's not. It's just a hint that in the Old Testament there was this this beginning of a promise that even death would not stop God's plans from being fulfilled, and that He would somehow bring us back, bring them back up. It was hinted at when Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, and he said, me and the boy will return. And the author of Hebrews says it's because Abraham reckoned that God could even raise the dead. It's hinted at in Romans when Abraham uh, saw that or believed God and it was credited as righteousness to him because Romans says, Paul says in Romans that Abraham believed that Sarah's uh, womb was as good as dead, that God could raise up the dead. There's, there's a sense of raising up. It's more than just geographical. It's more than just bringing your bones back and, and giving you a grave here. It's, it's the core hope of all what's going to unfold in the entire rest of the Bible, which is resurrection. That's always the, the Hebrew promise, the Hebrew goal was not die and be disembodied somewhere forever. Early Hebrews may have, some may have thought about that, and that's where the concepts of Sheol and the grave and die and we go there and what happens after that. But there's a hint in the Hebrew scriptures that there's something after that, that there's life after life after death. And it doesn't come to fruition until the intertestamental period, the time that the Apocrypha was written, and then specifically in the New Testament, it fully blooms. And we get this full-blown Jewish doctrine of resurrection, that on the last day when everything's said and done, God's going to raise everyone from the grave, and there will be judgment. And that's when all the rights will be I mean, all the wrongs will be righted, and everyone will receive recompense for what they've done, and, and that's when it'll be finished. And somewhere along the way, this got melded and merged with a Greco-Roman uh, concept of dying and going off into the afterlife and disembodied spirits, and this body's just a shell. And, and that's all paganism. That's all Greco-Roman paganism. The, the Jewish, the Hebrew concept was, even if you go down, I'll raise you up. In other words, this body that God has made for us is a good thing. Now, now, you can't, obviously, all of that is not in this passage. But I just want to point it out because it's, it's, it's a hint. It's one of those things that, like the early church did, you, you, once you see how it turns out after the resurrection, then you go back and you look at passages like this and you go, huh, that's interesting that it's worded that way. And that's what the early church would do after the resurrection of Jesus. They would go back and reread the Old Testament with new eyes. And they would see these psalms about God raising up. And they would go, there it is. Why didn't we get it? Because of the promise that they uh, received and, and the evidence of that promise through the resurrection. So I just want to mention it because it's worth mentioning. And it's a huge point of biblical theology. The Jewish hope was not go to heaven when you die. It wasn't the Jewish hope. The Jewish hope was die, go somewhere, hopefully with God, somewhere restful, whatever. But eventually then, everyone's raised up and you come back and you get your body back and you get this world back that God created. Only it's not the same. It's on a whole new level of awesomeness than it was after the six days. So that's, that's where everything heads theologically. But anyway, God says this. To Jacob, uh, I'm gonna, you're going to go down, but I'm going to surely, and then he wrote, so it's, it's, it's an infinitive, it's absolute, I'm going to absolutely bring you back up. So don't be afraid to go down there. Then Jacob left Beersheba, and Israel's sons took their father Jacob and their children and their wives in the carts that Pharaoh had sent to transport. They also took with them their livestock and the possessions they had acquired in Canaan, and Jacob and all his offspring went to Egypt. He took with him to Egypt his sons and grandsons, his daughters and granddaughters, all his, and I be his offspring, but by now you should know what that word really is in Hebrew. All his what? Seed. Yes, he's getting it. All of his seed. There's that other term for the covenant. I will bless you. I will make your offspring, your seed, great. So here again, this is drawing it to a, it, it's basically emphasizing God is keeping his promise, even with this, from their perspective, unexpected term. You know, God had given them the promised land, this is where you're going to settle, and all of a sudden, boom, there's seven years of famine there. Well, God, thanks, but this really doesn't seem like a great deal you've set us up with. 
Well, you got to leave that land. But God, this is our promised land. I know. Still, you're going to leave the land. See, God takes that into account. He's not rigid and he's not defined and he's not held in hostage by his own promises. And when, in, on the literal realm, like, like you have to you no, know, he can fulfill his promises because he's always faithful to his promises, but he can fulfill them in radically unexpected ways. And that's, that's another point of emphasis that the, the Joseph story shows. God's fulfilling, he's keeping his promises. Nobody's saying God doesn't keep his promises. But he's doing it in ways that are totally unexpected. And again, that's what people in the New Testament would find out. They'd realize, they'd think all was lost standing before the cross. They'd just think, this is over. Our, our Messiah is dead. If we thought it was going to be great. We'd be like the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Everything was going to be awesome. And then now it's all gone. And that's when, when all hope is lost, that's when God comes through and does the miraculous. And the miraculous turns out to be what had been foreshadowed all along. We just couldn't see it because of our perspective. And so that's what God's doing here. That's what God's doing when he's keeping promises in your own lives. Is you, think, you may think, you know, especially some of you come from a more charismatic background. So you get a word of knowledge from somebody. God's going to do this in your life. And, and maybe it's true, you know, because I, I think that stuff still happens. So maybe God has made you a promise and you are holding on to it. But then your life completely doesn't look like that. Does that mean that God didn't speak that? Maybe. If he did speak it, does that mean he's breaking his word? No. It just means he's going to fulfill it in a way that you can't even expect, that you, that you would not have planned for. So it's important whether we're dealing with our own lives, you know, God, this is how God's going to fulfill his promises, or specifically, and this is what I deal with a lot, writing about end times and eschatology, it's specifically important to not pigeonhole God into certain end times plans that he has to uphold. You know, you're watching the news in the Middle East and you're trying to, God's got to do this. Oh, that dome of the rock's got to come down because this guy got he could he could completely do his fulfill his promises in a way that totally looks nothing like any of So then, who's going down to Egypt? Well, we're going to get an account here. These are the names of the sons of Israel, Jacob and his descendants, who went to Egypt. Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob. So he's going to go through birth order. Uh, he's going to, they're going to be broken up into four sections based on the four. Uh, mothers of the sons of Jacob here. So, these are the all of Leah's offspring are going to be first. Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob. Sons of Reuben, Hanak, Halu, Hezron, and Carmi. So, Hanak, Halu, Hezron, and Carmi would become the head of clans. So, the Carmites and, and the Palaites and the Hezronites, they, they, this would have been where those clans would have come from. These are from the tribe of Reuben because they are Reuben's sons. So this has been important because, remember, the original readers of this, the for people who are first reading these words after they're written down, are the Exodus generation going into, in, into the Promised Land. And so they would have need to have known where they're coming from. That's the point of Genesis, giving them their background. This is where you came from. This is who you are. The sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. Random thing that's thrown in there that you might have skipped over reading. Why is that significant? Well, Israel wasn't supposed to intermarry with the Canaanites. They were specifically told not to intermarry with the Canaanites. And later, it's because they would be brought back to expel the Canaanites, who by the time of the conquest had become so wicked that God's last recourse was, I'm going to drive you out of this land. But yet, right here, in the tribes of Israel, in the genealogy of the family, the promised family, is the son of the Canaanite. It's just a little hint to show that God's family, God's people, Israel, have always been multinational. They've always been ethnically diverse. It's never been about just we've got to keep the race pure, we've got to keep our... You know, like, like we've said before, interracial marriage has never, ever been prohibited in the Bible. What was prohibited was interreligious marriage. So what this tells us is this Canaanite wife is then incorporated into the people of Israel. Just like later people like Ruth, Rahab, and others would be incorporated into, become part of it. So the borders of Israel have never been genetic. They've never been strictly tribal or geographical. Even though that's how people think of them today and try to apply them today, they've always been um, somewhat fluid. 
And it's always been based on covenant faith. Not any other factor, but covenant faith. If you're willing to enter into covenant people and, and live under the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, welcome to Israel. So even in the Old Testament, and then especially in the New Testament, when, when Jesus burst the doors wide open to Gentiles in the ministry of Paul. But I want you to see that this, it's not a New Testament concept. It's right here, even in the Old Testament. And it will be explicit in Exodus when the, the people that come out of the, uh, Egypt include a mixed multitude. And they cons constitute the people of Israel. So again, you can't do a simple equation. Israel equals the Jews. You can't do it now in modern Israel. You can't do it then in biblical Israel. Because it's not that simple. It's Israel equals the people of covenant faith. So, uh, where were Simeon? So, the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, Merari. The sons of Judah, Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Aaron, Onan, had died in the land of Canaan. We read that story a few weeks ago. The sons of Perez, Hezron, and Hamun. The sons of Issachar, Tova, Pua, Yashub, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulun, Sarad, Elon, and Jaleel. These were the sons of Leah, Borda, Jacob, and Kadamara, besides his daughter, Dina. These sons and daughters were 33 in all. Now, the sons of Gad, Zephon, Haggai, Shuni, Esbon, Ari, Arodi, Arelin. The sons of Asher, Imna, Ishba, Ishbi, and Berea. Their sister was Sarah. The sons of Berea, Eber, Malkia. These were the children born to Jacob by Zilpah, whom Laban had given to his daughter Leah, 16 in all. The sons of Jacob's wife, Rachel, was the favorite wife. Joseph and Benjamin. In Egypt, Manasseh and Ephraim were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, the priest of Rome. Here again is another instance of non-Jewish, or, or at this point, strictly within the family, sons being part of the tribes of Israel. Two of the tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh, the half-tribes as they're called, their mom was Egyptian. So Israel is made up of people with Canaanite mothers, with Egyptian mothers. You get this point of what I'm saying here, hopefully. This is showing the diversity of the family of Israel. Um, the sons of Benjamin, Bella, Becker, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ehi, Rosh, Mupim, Hupim, and Ar. These are the sons of Rachel who were born to Jacob, 14 and all. The sons of Benjamin. When you think of this story and the Joseph story, if you watched the cartoons growing up or you went to flannel boards, Sunday school programs and you saw it, you always think of Benjamin being this little boy. He was a dad. He was a man by now. He was in his 20s or 30s. Um, the son, you know, at this point, Judah's in his 60s or 70s. So when you're thinking about this story of the sons of Jacob and Joseph, it's not like, you know, it becomes that because we tell it to our kids and be nice to your brothers and that kind of stuff. But, but these are adults. This is a family. This is a saga involving adult people who have already become fathers and even grandfathers. And then you have at the head of it all, Jacob, the great grandfather of them all. Um, lastly, the son of Dan was Husham. The sons of Naphtali were Jaziel, Guni, Jezer, and Shimon. These were the sons born to Jacob by Bilhah, whom Laban had given to his daughter Rachel, seven in all. In all, those who went to Egypt with Jacob, those who were his direct descendants, not counting his son's wives, numbered 66 persons. With the two sons who had been born to Joseph in Egypt and members of Jacob's family, which went to Egypt, were 70 in all. There's a footnote in your Bible. It's a good Bible. There's a footnote there that says at the bottom, LXX 75 or Septuagint 75 or something like that. What that's saying is in the Greek version of the Old Testament, this number is 75. In the Hebrew versions, it's 70. There's, there's, there's a discrepancy between the Greek and the Hebrew. In the New Testament, when, when this is quoted in the book of Acts, when, when Stephen's recounting the whole story of Israel, and he talks about this, it's 75. So the Greek Septuagint tradition, it was, it was 75 people. In the Hebrew Masoretic tradition, it was 70 people. And there's uncertainty about which one was the correct one. However, in Old Testament, the way numbers work, it's okay either way. Because numbers, this is in a pre-scientific age, in a pre-metrics age, where they weren't concerned with, with specific numbers as much as the importance of the numbers, what the numbers signify. And in this case, this genealogy has been constructed and has been, you know, 
fiddled around with and put in a certain order in order to get to the number 70, or in the Greek tradition, 75. Why 70? What's the big deal? Well, in chapter 10 of Genesis, God had separated all of the earth, had the sons of Noah had separated into all the earth, and you had the 70 nations. There was a tradition of the 70 nations, and so it was like Israel and then the 70 nations. That, that's a theme in, in throughout scripture. And so in this instance, then, it's like Israel is being presented in the mold of all humanity. Israel is being presented as its own seven. Israel is being presented as, it's not just a family of this guy named Israel anymore, but, but this is the new humanity, the new sons of Noah. They're, and they're not going to spread out all over the earth. They're going to spread out and multiply in Egypt. And, and so there's a sense that Israel is already starting, the family of Israel is already starting the job or the role of the future nation of Israel, which is to represent the people, to represent the world, to, to stand in the place, in the gap between the world and between God, and to reconcile, to be a nation, a kingdom of priests. And so it's implicit in this structuring of this genealogy to, 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 to bring to mind the 70 of Genesis 10 or 75, given the um, discrepancy, the point is, this is the birth, or this is the beginning of a new thing that God's doing. Israel's family going down to Egypt is not just one man's family seeking refuge from a famine, but it is the birth. Egypt is, as one commentator says, Egypt is the womb in which Israel will be born as a nation. They're going down to Egypt, and they're going to emerge in the next book of the Bible they're going to emerge as a multitude in the thousands and thousands and thousands. And so it's all beginning right here. Israel is going to be almost like the new humanity, the, the new post-flood people. Um, so literarily, that's what's going on with this genealogy. Again, genealogies aren't random, and they're never put in place just for information purposes. There's always a literary purpose to the genealogy. Sometimes it's a big picture like this one. Sometimes it has a more narrow focus, but there's always a good example in the New Testament, Matthew's genealogy. He breaks it into three sections, and each one's 14 generations, and each one represents a specific epoch in Israel's history, pre-monarchy, monarchy, post-exile. So there's a purpose in the genealogies, and when we skip them, then we miss some of that. Uh, so we'll... Let's see how it goes. They head out. Now Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to get directions to Goshen. When they arrived in the region of Goshen, Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and he wept for a long time. Fourth time he's wept in this story. And this one is the longest. He doesn't try to hide it. He doesn't try to brush his face off or wash his face and come back. He weeps for a long time. Uh, his father, the father that he loved, that he was taken away from through force, sold into slavery, who thought he was dead all these years, and now he's reunited. This is, this is resurrection. Uh, in this instance, Jacob's son that he thought was dead is, is back from the dead. So it's a really touching moment in this story. Uh, Israel said to Joseph, now I'm ready to die. He's been talking about his death, so he's still thinking about his death, but now it's happy. Now I'm ready to die since I have seen for myself that you are still alive. In other words, like Simeon, way later in the New Testament, when he finally sees the baby Jesus, and he says, now I can be, you know, dismiss your servant of peace, God. I can, my eyes have seen the salvation of Israel. He's finally, this is, I, I'm, I'm happy now. I, I won't go down to the grave in, in distress, like he said in the last <coughs> chapter. I'll go down to the grave in peace because my son is alive. My family is continuing on. God is keeping all of his promises. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I'll go up and speak to Pharaoh, and I'll say to him, My brothers and my father's household, who are living in the land of Canaan, have come to me. The men are shepherds. They tend livestock, and they've brought along their flocks and herds and everything they own. When Pharaoh calls you in and asks, What's your occupation? You should answer, Your servants have tended livestock from our boyhood on, just as our fathers did. And then you will be allowed to settle in the region of Goshen. For all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. And this is an instance where, remember, Egypt is a very cosmopolitan society. They're nice. They're, they're the, the ancient metrosexuals we talked about. They're smooth and shaved and use makeup and 
ointments and, and perfumes and all kinds of, they're very, they're, they're civilized, they're city people. They don't do the shepherd thing. They get other people to do the shepherd thing for them, and then they trade grain for their goods. And so, in this case, you got a 70 or 75 rowdy family of these mountainous folk that are coming in, and, and they need a place to be. Well, luckily, fortunately, in the providence of God, there's a whole region of Egypt that's perfect for shepherding. It's called Goshen. The Egyptians weren't really thrilled about it because they didn't do the shepherd thing, but it would have been great. And that's where they're going to eventually go. So he tells them, Joseph tells them, hey, just go to Pharaoh and be honest. Tell them who you are. Tell them what you do because God has already prepared all of this in advance. And the perfect place, the perfect land for this period of time is already waiting for them. We just have to make sure Pharaoh gives him and lets everybody know it's okay. And these aren't just some invading horde coming into Egypt to take up the land, which had happened before and was happening during this period of time. There was... All this, there was a period where Egypt was ruled by the Hyksos, which were later called the Shepherd Kings, which were these foreigners that came in and basically took over Egypt. So if this is before then, uh, or if this is after then, then this would be a way of letting Pharaoh know, hey, we're, we're not here to take over anything. We just, we just want to be left alone and do our thing. So we are out of time. It's going on the dot, so we will honor everybody's time. Thanks for coming this week. Next week, we'll pick it up. We'll see how they get settled. There's going to be a final tying up of some family stuff. And then the book of Genesis is going to end looking forward the whole rest of the Bible. So be back in the next two, three weeks as we finish out this book we've been in for over a year. Have a great week.